Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the Centura Grand Rounds. Um, I appreciate everybody taking some time to come by and, and listen to my lecture here. Let me get everything started. So the lecture is low back pain and new x-ray findings of a spinal curve, mainstream and alternative treatment options. So I wanna start this by going through a content outline. Uh, this lecture is designed for a non-surgeon audience, so I hope that maybe some surgeons will get some benefit out of it. Uh, and we're going to start off with just an introduction into spinal curves in adults, but the main point of this is to concentrate on the small spinal curves. Uh, and we're going to have a brief review of the different scoliosis types and kind of discuss why there are so many. And then we're going to transition into actually evaluating a lumbar radiograph or a lumbar x-ray, uh, review specific measurements that can be easily done on anybody's computer. Then we're going to move on to try to discuss the origins of adult degenerative scoliosis. It's not studied that well, but we're going to look at kind of disc and facet pathophysiology and questionable genetics. Then we're going to do a case study evaluating a new patient with adult degenerative scoliosis to kind of go through that process from a non-surgical perspective. And lastly, we're going to discuss the mainstream treatment options, which is classically a large thoracolumbar fusion. And then spend a little bit more time looking at alternative and novel treatment options, such as short segment constructs, where we recreate the neutral segment of a vertebrae, uh, and then also discuss neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulator uh, placement for adults with degenerative scoliosis. Um, disclosures, I have no disclosures. Uh, a little bit about me. So my name is Josh Beckman. I'm a board certified neurosurgeon. Uh, here you can see a picture of me in uniform uh, with my little girl. She's now almost two years old, leading the way. Uh, I was giving her and my wife a tour of the hospital. Um, and so a little bit about my experience. I was previously the chair uh, or vice chair of Department of Neurosurgery uh, for San Antonio Military Medical Center, which is the largest Department of Defense hospital in the U.S. Uh, we were a level one trauma center. We saw civilians, retirees, beneficiaries, just kind of all comers. Uh, during my stay there, I was the director of spinal surgery. Um, I was the director of spinal oncology there. Uh, my main specialty is kind of minimally invasive and lateral access surgical techniques. Um, <clears throat> as we all do, anybody who presents here, we've got plenty of peer-reviewed publications, uh, book chapters. I'm a routine contributor in Dr. Greenberg's Handbook of Neurosurgery, which he is one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, and the multiple national and international oral presentations. And I think the most important thing is uh, today's Veterans Day. So happy Veterans Day uh, to all the veterans out there. You know, if you know someone who served, please say thank you. They've gone through more than you can possibly imagine uh, and not for very much. And so they, they really, you know, dedicate their lives to serving this country. And, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I, I appreciate everything that everybody does. So moving on. Um, what is considered a spinal curve? I got some pictures here uh, that I want to share with you. So this is a picture of adult degenerative scoliosis, and this is a very easy thing to pick up on and not the point of this lecture, but I did want to share some insight with you. Some people is like, is this a left-sided curve? Is this a right-sided curve? But it's really easy to determine the difference between that. If you just draw an arrow right here, uh, and that's pointing toward the left side, so that's a left-sided curve. Um, another aspect of this is another curve. So this is a right-sided curve. If we draw an arrow here, it points to the right. Um, this patient also has a lateral ascesis, which we're gonna go into detail. But once again, these are very easy to pick up. You see these, uh, if you're not a spine specialist, they probably need a referral to a spine specialist. And lastly, this is an elderly person with a progressive curve, um, easy to pick up, You know, is nothing to manage. The discussion here is not about that. What we are really interested in is early diagnosis of a spinal curvature, uh, meaning this picture right here. This is a patient of mine that I saw recently. This is her initial films from two years, ago, two years ago, and this is the more current one. And the idea here is to have someone look at this and evaluate and say, is there anything that we can do about this besides a one or two level fusion? And that's kind of the overall conversation that I want to have as we go through this topic. And the idea is to stop the curve progression before it gets to here to where you may need a longer uh, construct. So continuing on, quick definitions of a spinal curvature. Um, so scoliosis is kind of a catch all term. Uh, I didn't, I specifically didn't use it in this title because I didn't want people to think scoliosis, oh, I don't wanna hear about it. Um, the main thing is looking at a very small curve like this. And if you look at the bottom left of your screen, 
what is the definition of scoliosis throughout all of these? Well, scoliosis is defined as a coronal cob measurement greater than or equal to 10 degrees. And so on the right side of your screen here, I've demonstrated what a coronal cob measurement looks like. And we're gonna go into the details of that in just a bit. Um, we're gonna talk about adult degenerative scoliosis, so scoliosis and a skeletally, skeletally mature spine. Uh, but there is adult idiopathic scoliosis, which is kind of a continuation of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is new scoliosis that starts at age 10 to 18. You also have juvenile scoliosis, which is really ages four to nine, congenital scoliosis, which someone is born with perhaps a hemivertebrae and they're just born with an abnormal spine. Uh, neuromuscular scoliosis is, is very common. We see this quite commonly, and let's say a patient with cerebral palsy where they don't have the ability to really control their paraspinal muscles. So they have asymmetric firing, which creates a curve. And then there's many types of kyphosis, human's kyphosis, kyphoscoliosis, all these other things. But the main point of this lecture is a small curve, understanding how to assess it and doing case studies and looking at different treatment paradigms for it. Um, of note, if you're looking at x-rays, I just wanna point this out, is that anytime you see an x-ray and you're sure, not unsure which side is left, which side is right, you're always gonna see an R or an L here. Uh, and this one, so this is the right side, DLE is probably gonna be the x-ray text initial. Sometimes there's a number there. And then in this specific x-ray, there are little BBs right there. And so I know that this x-ray is actually supine and not upright because the BBs are gravity dependent. So they would be down here. Um, and I'll point that out as we go through, but just small things for people to learn. Okay, lumbar x-ray measurements. We briefly mentioned a Cobb angle. So a Cobb angle was developed by Dr. John Robert Cobb, an orthopedic surgeon, 1948. I believe he worked in New York uh, and he wanted to determine and track the progression of scoliosis. And so um, how do you measure a Cobb angle? This is very basic, but here's the definition. I, I just kind of found this funny. Um, to measure the Cobb angle, one must first decide which vertebrae are the invertebrae of the curve deformity, also known as the terminal, terminal vertebrae defined as the vertebral or vertebrae whose end plates are most tilted towards each other. And so in layman's terms is you find the curve and you measure the most tilted vertebrae. It's very simple and straightforward. Um, what is the definition of scoliosis versus a small spinal curvature? Well, scoliosis, as we talked about before, is a coronal cob angle measured at greater than or equal to 10 degrees. Uh, I had a question, I was going through this with some of my PAs the other day, and they were like, I thought scoliosis was 30 degrees. And 30 degrees is a very common number, but the true definition is 10 degrees. Usually we start treating when they're 30 degrees. And so there's a, there's a difference there. Um, and then where do you specifically measure? And then why do you measure at a specific spot? Um, this is kind of open for interpretation. Uh, there are some uh, surgeons and um, radiologists that are very regimented and dogmatic. I'm really not that way. I kind of look at the screen, find the apex vertebrae, which would be the center of your curve, and look for the most tilted segments, and then that's where I develop my coronal cob measurement. Okay, uh, let's move on. All right, so this is a video that I took, and I wanted to show the audience how to actually perform a coronal cob measurement. Uh, this patient has baseline degenerative spondylosis, no scoliosis, his spine is straight, it's wonderful, he's in the 70s. And we're gonna briefly discuss this, but this patient has symmetric uh, degeneration of his disc as opposed to asymmetric degenerations. And so I'm gonna play this video and this is using our PAC system. And the first thing that you do is you right click and you're gonna get this little sub screen here and then go to annotations. And then all the way up there, you're going to have arrow and then angle. And you're going to click angle. Then you click and make a measurement. And right here, I'm just measuring the end plate. And then you click again and make a secondary measurement. And you can see that dotted line that connect the two. And what it's going to do is give you an angle. And you can move this line up. You can move this line down. You can increase the angle. You can decrease the angle to whatever you need to. So there's a lot of variability in this type of measurement. Now, I'm going to go to the other side. Once again, you right click, go down to annotations, go to angle. And then here, I'm going to measure lumbar lordosis, which is probably the more important measurement uh, in treating scoliosis than coronal cob angle, but we're talking about just diagnosing it. And so here, you can tell that all it does is it draws an angle between the two lines. It imagines that the lines are connected. And they have 48 degrees 
uh, lumbar lordosis, which is completely normal, and it has almost no spinal curvature. So this patient has symmetric degeneration of his disc, generalized uh, spondylosis. Okay, the next video. So this is a video, once again, I think repetition is key if you don't know how to do this, and I'm sorry for those that already know how to do this, but you right click, go to angle, and this patient actually does have some scoliosis. Uh, so I'm looking at the measurement, I'm assessing the actual vertebrae here, I'm like, all right, well, this looks like uh, the lowest tilt and angle right here. And so I'm drawing a line, and then I'm gonna go all the way up to the top here, I'm gonna draw a secondary line, and what I suspect is how the vertebral body looks and this is gonna be at 10 degrees. So by definition, this is considered a scoliosis. Now, another interesting component here is if you look at the patient, and this is a very subtle finding, they are actually tilted to the left side and they have something called a fractional curve, which is a whole nother type of conversation. Uh, but here I'm drawing a straight line up to determine how far over the patient is tilted because this is helpful in clinical decision-making. And if you actually draw this on, it makes you look, it's like, wow, they actually are really tilted to the left side. And so if there's any, you know, if you're ever concerned, it's like, man, do they have scoliosis? Do they not? Should they see someone? This is a very helpful way to look at things. And you can tell here that the vertebral body is almost completely outside the midline, which wasn't quite obvious when we first looked at this. Okay, continuing on with lumbar x-ray measurements. There's only two. That, that we're going to go over in this lecture. There's plenty, but we don't need to discuss them. So lateral lysesis. So what is lateral lysesis? It's essentially a lateral slip in the spine. Uh, we do have anterior and posterior lysesis called a spondylolysesis. It takes time to learn how to say that. Uh, I practiced when I was a resident. Um, but lysesis really means to slip or slippage. And so how is a lysesis measured? Well, it's measuring how much a vertebral body has slipped over the body beneath it. And so this radiologist did a really good job and they measured almost a 15 millimeter lateral slip of L3 on L4, which is really important for us in predicting disability and surgical outcomes. Um, there was a recent study published this year in September, a uh, very good study in the journal of neurosurgery. It said lateral thoracolumbar lysesis as an independent predictor of disability in adult scoliosis patients. Multivariate assessment before and after surgical realignment. And what their conclusion was is that lateral lysis is associated with worse baseline disability among scoliosis, and then resolution of severe lateral lysis following deformity correction was an independently associated with increased likelihood of re reaching uh, minimal clinical important difference at ODI to your follow-up. Uh, and so what that's saying is if there is a significant lysis like there is in this one, uh, you have to correct it or it will affect your outcomes. And it's an independent predictor of disability. So by definition, this patient is easily a surgical candidate. Um, and some people may be wondering, well, how do you correct a lateral lysesis? Well, I have an intraoperative video here that we'll review a little bit later, uh, but this is a, a PA or an AP uh, fluoroscopic radiograph. And this is a, a video of me actually correcting someone's lateral lysesis intraoperatively. Uh, this is from a lateral approach, but if you look at this video, you can see that the vertebral body is actually coming back and the entire top of the spine is moving in relationship to the bottom of the spine. So in essence, we're correcting a severe lateral lysesis, which is really, really interesting. Okay, moving on, pathophysiology. Why do some people develop adult degenerative scoliosis and others don't? Well, if we look at it, I always tell my patients about three things, time, gravity, and genetics. Um, you know, I tell them, I said, listen, there are two undefeated entities in this world time and gravity. They always win no matter what. Um, in genetics, unfortunately, you're kind of just born with, and there's nothing you can do about it except modify your risk factors. So we go on and we look at symmetric degeneration of your disc, meaning that the disc goes through and it, instead of going asymmetric, it goes symmetrically. It's very straightforward, like that first patient that we saw. Now, the main thing that I would like to point out is that this is just a vertebral body segment. Um, it is symmetric degeneration. Notice how the disc is bulging everywhere, but it's not asymmetric. It's everything's equivocal. Um, so if you look at asymmetric disc degeneration, what we think this is a result of, there hasn't been that much that's studied. It's kind of papers here and there that continue to quote like the first paper who studied it. Um, but we have small microscopic annular tears starting at age 15, uh, or maybe sooner if you were more active as a child. And then what this does is it creates scarring or vascular end group. 
Well, when you create scarring around the annulus, as we know, the nucleus propulsus is an avascular structure. And so you get diminished blood flow around it, so which further inhibits nutrients. And then when you get diminished blood flow, you get decreased nuclear cell density. And so when you get decreased nuclear cell density, it doesn't typically occur in a symmetric fashion. It occurs in an asymmetric fashion, which leads to an osmotic balance change. And then all of a sudden you have um, degenerative disc changes that are asymmetric. Uh, and so once you start developing some asymmetry, like in this picture right here, uh, then you have your gravitational vector that runs straight down. And so all of a sudden the majority of your load is on this patient's right side. And then it just creates this vicious cycle. Uh, as time progresses, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so risk factors. Smoking is a risk factor for everything. Everybody knows that if you're a smoker, you're at increased risk for pain, deformity, DVT, you, you name it. Um, obesity, obviously you have the mechanical load uh, that increases the gravitational vector, which furthers the vicious cycle, but also it increases the production of lapt leptin. Uh, leptin is a peptide hormone secreted by fat and it is thought to activate pathways that can be detrimental to disc integrity. So. You know, I tell my patients, I know it's really hard, you're in pain, but try to stay as lean as you possibly can. Um, and then osteoporosis. So osteoporosis used to be thought as an independent risk factor for scoliosis, uh, but there have been uh, multiple studies that show that actually, if you look at patients side by side, there's no increased risk of scoliosis. Uh, and so you had a preview to this. If you watch college football, this is my buddy, Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. Um, okay, so... Spinal progression over time. This is a really, really nice study uh, out of South Korea, and it's looking at the progression of a scoliosis curve. And we don't have very much evidence to document this, but what we think is, is about three degrees per year, ranging from one to six. So if you take a look at this side, 1994 versus 1999, you have essentially a straight curve. And then in 1999, Five years later, you began beginning to have adult degenerative scoliosis right here. And you can specifically see the asymmetry at what appears to be the L4, L5 disc level. Then fast forward six years later, you got significant progression of the curve. You're having lateral osteophytes. Now you have a true lateral lysis right there, which as we remember is an independent risk factor for disability. And then progress one year later, you have a significant progression of the curve. That's probably 10 degree progression. Uh, which is out of that threshold of one to six per year. And so that is uh, really important to pick up. And I think right there is the, is the major part to pick up on. So if we look at their second patient that they presented, uh, 1996, this is a very moderate small curve. And then you go to 2002, well, maybe just a little bit of progression. That's right in that one to three degrees. And then from 2002, over two years, you have a very significant progression developing of lateral osteophytes and overall generalized spondylosis. And then what I find really interesting is from C to D, there is a little progression, but it's not bad. And the difference between C and D here and C and D in here is pretty impressive. So uh, there are risk factors there that we may not know about, such as smoking and obesity. Uh, as we age, you know, unfortunately, we become less active, and which contributes to that vicious cycle. So the overall goal of this is not to discuss these, but is to discuss this and this. And let's say that we are able to evaluate a patient that transitions from here to here and has really bad axial back pain. And I go in here and I correct this uh, level, then maybe I can stop the progression. And we'll look at some images and post-operative follow-up looking at that. And so uh, please, please be on the lookout for these small types of curves, even if they're not 10 degrees. Okay, so early patient education. Here's a case study, a 56 year old female with mild back pain for about two years, here to see anybody for routine follow-up, primary care, neurosurgery, um, orthopedic, whatever. Um, her pain has improved with Motrin. Um, she's fairly active and what she wants to do, is she wants to walk her dog and she's having trouble walking more than four or five blocks. And when you see her, the B x-ray is the one that you actually get today. And then the A x-ray is the one you had two years ago. And so now you have this patient in your office that's mildly symptomatic. And I wanted to go through some questions uh, to kind of ask as you go through. So is the patient mildly symptomatic or they have a progressive symptoms? In this patient case, I would say that they're just mildly symptomatic, continue with Motrin and let's get another x-ray. Um, and then that leads to the second question, how often should I order x-rays? I think if you see scoliosis, but they're asymptomatic, you should absolutely order yearly x-rays to start seeing that progression. And you can start the conversation with the patient that way they don't 
get to that major curve and all of a sudden they're seeing a spine specialist like oh my gosh you need a big surgery um another question is there a lateral ascesis we looked at that earlier independent risk factor for disability um so keep your eye out for that one uh has the curve progressed or is it stable in this instance the curve has progressed but the patient is relatively asymptomatic so you can continue to follow um and then you're talking about it you're showing with patients and you're like, all right, well, we're going to send you to physical therapy. There's no contraindication to physical therapy with any type of scoliosis curve. Um, one of the questions that commonly get asked is, is PT going to help correct the scoliosis? And the answer is no. Um, this is a degenerative phenomenon. Remember time and gravity, two undefeated entities, it's not going to correct it. Um, and, but I do tell them it's great for core strengthening exercises, and you may be able to slow the progression of the curve, though we don't have any evidence to study that right now, or we don't have any evidence to support that. Uh, that's just what we think. And then uh, what about lumbar traction? So that's a great one. Um, I think lumbar traction is fantastic, but remember time and gravity, those are the two major F factors. So it'll transiently release your curve, but as gravity reloads on your axial spine, then you're gonna come back to your regular curve. Um, I had a patient on Monday that literally went through this list uh, before I made it. And I was like, man, I really wanna videotape you for this lecture. Uh, but he asked me about lumbar traction, PT, and then an inversion table. He's like, doc, I got an inversion table uh, off of like uh, offer up or something. And he's like, can I use it? And I was like, sure, you can absolutely use a traction table or an inversion table to, and if it helps, then perfect, keep going. If it doesn't help, then don't use it. Uh, but eventually it'll just transiently offload your spine. So if you're feeling better with it, that tells me that you're having pain uh, associated with your adult degenerative scoliosis. Um, another important question to ask is back pain, leg pain, or having both. Uh, there's a huge difference between back pain and leg pain. And I consider butt pain and the leg pain paradigm because that's a, a radiculopathy. Let's say we had this patient right here who's having purely leg pain. Well, instead of doing a fusion on him, we can potentially go in through a tube and uh, just do a small laminotomy and free up the nerve roots that are compressed on the uh, concavity of the curve. So that's a really important one. Back pain, that one doesn't help so much with. And then, you know, question, when should you see a spine specialist? Um, I, I think that if you see any type of curve or progression of a curve, I think that you should certainly have the patient see a spine specialist so they can at least establish care. It doesn't really mean they need surgery, um, but it's good to know someone for a few years and see their curve progress and then have that conversation and a rapport. I think patients do much better that way. So this is a great transition, operative versus non-operative treatment for adult symptomatic lumbar scoliosis. When I was, um, we have to take continuing med medical education for our uh, board certification every year. And going over this paper was one of our requirements. And this was a really fantastic paper published in 2017. And it had essentially two columns of treatment. It had a randomized uh, perspective follow-up uh, patients randomized into operative treatment and non-operative treatment. And they also had an observation cohort uh, where they looked at people who didn't undergo surgery and who did undergo surgery. And essentially it said that on the basis of as treated and minimally clinically important uh, difference analysis, if a patient with adult symptomatic lumbar scoliosis is satisfied with the current spine related health, non-operative treatment is advised. Uh, and with the understanding that improvement is unlikely. If the patient is not satisfied with the current spine health and expects improvement and surgeries is preferred. So essentially if the patient is doing okay, then they're <laughs> doing surgery is not gonna help them because it's really hard to keep them take them from a good baseline and make them better. Uh, but if they're slowly progressing and you operate on them, then they can come up to a better baseline when it comes for SRS satisfaction, ODI, and I think VAS in this study. So um, another interesting component was in the randomized cohort where they went from randomized surgery versus no surgery, they had a 64% crossover. Uh, so there's good evidence to treat, treat people who are in pain and are do, not doing well on conservative management. Okay. So treatment options for adult degenerative scoliosis. Well, these are two, this is a patient of mine. Um, this patient came to me in an advanced stage. She has a pretty significant curve. It's a moderate to severe. And the classic treatment is a T10 to pelvis fusion. And there are a lot of different ways to accomplish this task. And some ways are better in surgeon's hands. Some ways are better than other surgeon's hand. And so you have the differences in open surgery versus purely minimally invasive surgery. Uh, you also have this hybrid and a combination of open approach and minimally invasive approach. 
versus the classic open approach. And then you, know, you can even further delineate this into uh, open anterior and posterior versus pure posterior only. So we have all these subcategories. Uh, and when you go through it, you know, you kind of look at this and you're like, all right, which approach is better? Is it open, MIS, hybrid, all posterior, combined anterior and posterior? Well, um, with anything in medicine and in surgery, this is a highly debated and controversial and even emotional subject. Uh, you know, you, you'd be surprised if you go to some of these conferences and, and listen to some really big names speak. Um, but there have been some studies, uh, they're all level three uh, and level four evidence, but they stated that uh, minimally invasive patients actually leave the hospital earlier and have less blood loss. And then the MIS constructs, minimally invasive surgery constructs, tend to have lesser levels fused, but also less correction, meaning that the correction in their lumbar lordosis and coronal curve is less than the open procedure. Um, and then the MIS also take longer, but have less blood loss. And so that makes sense. You know, MIS surgery, let's take, for instance, tying your shoes. If you just tie your shoes, normal open, then you can do it fast, easy, you can see everything. But with minimally invasive surgery, imagine tying your shoes through a little box about that big. Um, it's gonna take a little bit more effort and a little bit more skill, um, or maybe not a little more skill, but just a little bit more uh, understanding of how to work in those confined environments. And that's why sometimes MIS surgery takes longer. And I always say to the patient, it's much harder on the surgeon, better on you when you do MIS surgery. Um, and then looking at this, open and MIS surgeries have similar outcomes at two years. So, you know, VAS, ODI, uh, and the revised SRS, which is Scoliosis Research Society uh, 22 form. And so Evans, you know, my own opinion is that there is no perfect surgery. There's too many variables to consider. You know, what was their curve before surgery? What was their curve after surgery? What's their fragility index? And all these variables that we try to do. And we got, you know, T1 angle, all these different variables. And so what I really think it is, it's highly dependent on the surge training and complication profile. There's some surgeons that are amazing at open posterior fusion that have fantastic results. As long as the surgeons are uh, submitting their data to uh, you know, national databases and following their outcomes and they're having great outcomes and that is fantastic. So there's no one right way to do this. It's just based on the surgeon, their training and their capabilities. Um, all right, this is kind of my favorite part and this is the fun part. So alternative treatment options for adult degenerative uh, scoliosis. So what happens when we catch scoliosis before something or before it progresses to a major curve? So here's a patient with a small right-sided curve. Okay, if you draw an arrow right here, it points, uh, sorry, left-sided curve, that points to the left side. Um, and then this is the progression over two years. We went over this. And then here's the progression 10 years later. So now the patient is too old, the fragility index is too high. So there's nothing really I can do to fix this curve. Um, so, here are the questions. Can a smaller surgery stop the progression of uh, the spinal curve? I and mean, we don't know the answer to that quite yet. And one of the spine proverbs that I always say, I heard in residency, you go to any of these uh, national meetings is, you're either creating deformity or you're fixing it. Um, so for instance, if this patient gets just a one or two level fusion that stops at the apex of the curve without correcting deformity, well, you're almost 100% guaranteed to get something, something called adjacent segment failure, more pain and more surgery. And so the idea is, well, maybe if we stop the progression of the curve, we can slow down that process. Um, and, and the question is, what happens if you pull the apex of the curve into normal alignment? And so let's look into this further. Good transition here. Here's a paper I wrote, and I think it was published in 2017. Uh, does MIS surgery allow for shorter constructs and the surgical treatment of adult spinal deformity? Really nice study. Um, it is a Retrospective uh, review, we had two patient cohorts um, that were propensity matched, one at a center that did open uh, surgery and then another center that did purely MIS surgery. And our conclusion is, if you look down here, is that MIS techniques for adult spinal deformity may reduce construct length, reoperation rates, blood loss, and length of stay without affecting clinical and radiographic outcomes when compared to a similar group of patients treated with open techniques. Uh, and so that was a really jumping off point for me and thinking about how to pursue adult degenerative deformity. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me, and I mentioned this earlier, is that there was a significant difference in postoperative lumbar lordosis, um, 43 degrees versus 49 degrees, and pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis correction, uh, 10 degrees and 5.2 degrees. And we haven't discussed those parameters um, because the idea is not to discuss the treatment algorithms. 
but those are the main indicators of uh, functional outcome scores after surgery. So with MIS surgery, you had less levels, but you had less correction, which makes sense, right? Because you're working through a smaller corridor uh, and it's all based on engineering of the tools. So, and I thought about this and I was like, well, if we, if MIS, if you can do it and also give good correction, then maybe the patient outcomes will be satisfactory. So can you correct a curve through an MIS approach? Here is an interesting case study. This is a patient of mine um, that came to me with low back pain and radiculopathy, and she had a progression of his curve of her curve. And you can see right here, if you look very closely, I'm sorry, the image is not uh, as detailed, but she, all, she has a lateral ascesis of L3 on L4. And what I did is I drew a line looking at the vertebral level that was not fused. Then what I did is a minimally invasive surgery through a lateral approach and corrected that lasesis. Now, if you look at this, her curve is not completely corrected, but her level above the curve is neutral now, whereas it was not neutral. And so the thought is, is that if you can make that segment a neutral segment, then you stop or at least slow that vicious cycle down. Um, and this is four years after surgery and she's doing well. So if you remember this video, this is where the video came from. And so if you look at this, you can see the correction through the side approach or the lateral approach. Uh, the side of the vertebral body is there and we're using a lax screw to pull that deformity over there. And you can see the entire spine regain height and correct the lateral ascesis. Okay, here's another case study. So you remember this aspect, we talked about lateral ascesis and how important that was. Here's a patient with a right-sided lateral ascesis. Notice that this image is upright. You can see the L delineates the left side. Uh, 11 is probably the text name. All right, so can you correct a curve through an MIS approach? Well, this is the apex of the curve right here. And if you draw a line through the center of it, this is a, a pretty far right-sided curve. Um, and the classic way to do this would be to do a T10 to pelvis because that's the way we're trained. But extrapolating the paper that I was involved with, I was like, well, maybe if we do this all MIS and make the apex of the curve an actual neutral segment, then we can save the patient a significant fusion. And so look at this and I'm like, okay, we make a post right here. And then if I can bring the vertebral body over to the patient's left side and make that segment a neutral segment, then maybe we can help them uh, with both their pain and uh, mobility. And so here's the outcome of the surgery. I was able to use um, a pelvic bolt because you have a really good foundation, something called a cobalt chrome rod. And I just pulled the entire spine over. And now if you look at this, this is the segment above the fusion, it's neutral. Now he still has some curvature to the left side because that's what he's had and it takes a while to accommodate for it, but it's a neutral segment, it's at zero degrees. Whereas before, you know, it's probably at 15, 20 degrees. And so this patient, I have three and a half year follow-up on and he's doing well. Now he is developing some adjacent segment failure right here because he's an active guy and he's about six foot 10. He's ultra tall. So he has a little bit more weight uh, on him, but he's overall very happy. I suspect that he will need another surgery uh, at that level. But if I can save him half a decade uh, from going up to T10 to pelvis, and I think that's a true win. All right, so continuing on, alternative treatment options for adult geodermatous scoliosis. So what is the difference between the two surgeries right here? Well, this patient got to a spine specialist later in the game, or she didn't want surgery, or she was refractory to any other intervention. And so unfortunately, she had to undergo a larger fusion construct. And as you can tell, this patient is actually tilted a little bit to the left, and that's okay. It's not about the coronal alignment, it's about the sagittal alignment, which I'll show you later. Um, and this patient got to relatively early in the game and was able to perform a much shorter construct. So, um, you know, early detection, I think, is the key, having a conversation, developing a rapport with the patient, and having true discussions about what's going on. Um, and so looking at it, we're talking, briefly discuss sagittal alignment. So if we look at these different curves I've drawn out and look on the right side of your screen here, this is a relatively flat back uh, compared to what it should be. So the lumbar lordosis is low. Um, the sagittal line is intact, but she has thoracic hypokyphosis, meaning that she's trying to compensate. And so after surgery, she has a much more anatomic curve and you can tell that she has relaxed in her thoracic spine and she's still relatively aligned, meaning that her ears are above her pelvis. If we looked at this surgery, which is the counterpart, the lateral radiograph to the AP, um, once again, relatively flat back right here. 
there's no curvature. And then after surgery, you can see a line drawn through the mid vertebral bodies and they have a fantastic curvature. And so not only is it coronal, but the most important thing in this is sagittal alignment, something called lumbar lordosis, pelvic incidence, and the delta between them. Uh, but that's certainly for another lecture, uh, but I briefly did want to mention it. Okay, um, so to recap, can you correct a curve through an MIS approach? Well, I think the answer is absolutely. Uh, you got to have a creative thought process. You got to have a really good patient understanding and a good discussion between the surgeon and the patient. Um, if you take the apex of the curve uh, and then pull it to a neutral segment, and then I think that provides some benefit to the patient. Um, what are the major risk factors? If you talk to any type of deformity surgeon, adjacent segment failure or something called PJK, proximal junctional kyphosis, is probably the thing that we fear most, meaning they break down the level above which we fuse. And so if you look at adjacent segment rate and deformity, and there's a really nice um, review of this as it was recently published, I think in 2018, but the failure rate is 20 to 40% in a T10 to pelvis. And so that's a really, really high. Uh, so my feeling is, is that, uh, you know, whether it's surgical or not, it's still people fail after these big open deformity surgeries at a high rate, um, despite what we do. And we're always trying new therapies to try to mitigate that. Um, and then you ask yourself, well, what is the adjacent segment failure rate in a short segment construct? So, well, we don't know the answer to that because that hasn't quite been studied. And so um, we communicate this with all of our patients. Uh, tolerance for mobility. Um, you know, the first time you do a T10 to pelvis, you see the patient in the post-op, you know, they're like, doc, man, I feel pretty good, but I can't tie my shoes, you know, and they're working on trying to get mobility. So you really minimize someone's mobility. As a matter of fact, I had a patient um, yesterday and he had he was 68, very active guy, likes to work on his truck, climb, hike, and everything else. And he was actually wanting a T10 to pelvis. I was like, man, you're not going to be able to do any of that, or it's going to be really hard for you to do that with a, uh, with a big surgery. So you, know, you got to think about mobility. And you ask the question, would you rather have better mobility with a short segment construct at the cost of potential increased risk of further surgery? Because we don't know the rate of degeneration with a short segment construct in adult degenerative scoliosis. And that's something that, you know, I plan on studying in future prospective studies uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, so we can have answers to those questions. Okay, moving on. So um, the last alternative treatment for adult degenerative scoliosis is neuromodulation, also known as a spinal cord stimulator. Um, this is also poorly studied in adult degenerative scoliosis because I think sometimes uh, the patients get large surgeries before they get access to this type of therapy. And sometimes that's not the case. Um, the reason I like this is that it is a completely reversible therapy. So that patient I was talking about yesterday, I actually, uh, talked him into a spinal cord stimulator trial. He had a fantastic result and we're going to do a spinal cord stimulator with him. Um, the patient undergoes a seven day percutaneous trial lead and either they're benefiting from it or they're not. And the vast majority of times they do receive some benefit. And so, you know, when should you consider uh, a spinal cord stimulator in someone? Well, you look at the fragility index. That's another preoperative indicator that we use for looking at adult degenerative scoliosis. Is their fragility index um, a contraindication to surgery? Um, you know, what happens to a younger patient that has a small curve, uh, but there's no progression and still has pain, you know? So I think that a good first line option for them may be a spinal cord stimulator because guess what? If the spinal cord stimulator doesn't work, you put it in, it works for two years and they come back to you. Well, you've given them two years and you've tried everything and then you can pursue uh, fusion surgery. Uh, secondly, you know, when to consider the patient's not a surgical candidate. One of my happiest patients I've ever had is um, he had two double lung transplants and he had severe scoliosis and really bad back pain. Obviously he's not a candidate for any type of fusion surgery. Uh, and so we put a spinal cord stimulator in him and he did fantastic. He still texts me every year uh, saying how well he's doing. So uh, I was very happy about that. And then lastly, in some of these patients, since it's a reversible therapy, it can be considered a first line therapy uh, in, in anybody. You just gotta have a discussion with the patient. And it's a really interesting group of patients. It's, it's, it's a huge dichotomy. You know, I had one patient the other day say, so wait, you're telling me I don't have to have fusion surgery. Um, you know, I, this is an outpatient surgery and it has the potential to help my back, leg and knee pain, sign me up immediately. And then you get the other side of that. And you have some patients that say, um, you're putting an electrode on my spine. Is it going to malfunction and shock me? Um, are they going to be able to track me and all this other, you know, odd questions. And so there's a huge dichotomy, dichotomy uh, in that patient population. 
Um, and some of them benefit and they go through psychologic testing and others don't, but I think it's an option to consider, especially for scoliosis. Um, all right, well, that really concludes my, my lecture here. Uh, this is a picture that I took on a hike probably in early November, it's beautiful. Um, here are my email addresses, so please feel free to reach me by email if you guys have any questions or concerns. And I think maybe we have some time for questions. I'm probably running you know, a couple minutes early, which is always good with CME. And thank you. Just a reminder that you can ask your questions via the chat function, or you can also unmute yourselves and ask. I hear a kiddo in the background. Okay, you can go ahead. Uh, can I get a question? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Um, so I'm an 81 year old practicing medical oncologist and, and actually superb general health. I discovered a couple of years ago that I had a lumbar scoliosis based on a CT study. I had no idea that I had that. Um, so I would, and it's virtually asymptomatic. It's not, it's no more than mild to, you know, borderline moderate, let's say mild. Um, I do know that sometimes in the morning after sleeping eight hours, I, my back, low back will be a little bit sore, but I, up and around, it's fine. So I'm listening to your talk. I'm concerned about progression and want to ask a question about what are lumbar support courses of any value or, or what I might do to try to keep it from progressing. Yeah, I think that, you know, that literature, uh, especially with adult, uh, I'm sorry, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, I mean, they have custom braces that stop progression on the curve. And so let's say we have two different types of off the shelf braces, you have a TLSO brace, which is that brace that kind of comes up here. And sometimes you see patients, I'm sure you've seen it before where it goes up to their neck, or just an LSO, which is a lumbosacral orthotic, there has not been any evidence that said it slowed the progression of the curve, probably because they haven't studied those. Um, and it's really hard for the custom fit braces in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis to really stop the progression as well. So, you know, I, my suggestion would be to try it, especially an LSO brace that fits pretty well and follow it, you know, and if it helps, then continue to wear it. If it doesn't help, then you're relatively asymptomatic, you know, and stay as lean as you possibly can and, you know, modify the risk factors that you can. I, I wish, there, I wish there was good studies, but there's, there's unfortunately not for that one for adults anyway. I appreciate that. So do I have to see a physician to get that prescribed or could I go directly to an orthopedic supply house? Uh, it's cheaper for you to go to an orthopedic supply house or even Amazon. You know, we send patients here to our orthopedic place and they're like, uh, this is going to cost you $300, but you can get an Amazon prime delivery, you know, hundred dollars. Uh, okay. it's, it's amazing how this works sometimes, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, but feel free to reach out and, um, you know, any other questions I'm happy to help out with. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, any other questions out there? I love questions, this is fun. Moderators, do you guys have anything? No, I think we are. I think that's it. I okay. will be. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckman, for uh, presenting today at Ventura Grand Round. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me. It was, it was a true honor. So thank you.